These impious scoundrels know very well that their ancient predecessors applied this verse of Haggai to the Messiah, as Lyra, Burgensis, and others testify, and still they wantonly depart from this and compose their own Bible out of their own mad heads, so that they hold their wretched Jews with them in their error, in violation of their conscience, and to our vexation. They think that in this way they are hurting us greatly, and that God will reward them, wherever for his sake, as they imagine, they have opposed us Gentiles, even in open, evident truth. But what happens, as you have seen, is that they disgrace themselves, and do not harm us, and further, forfeit God and his scripture. Thus the verse reads, Once again, in a little while, I will shake the heavens and the earth, and the sea and the dry land, these are the islands of the sea, and the chimdaf of all Gentiles shall come, that is, the Messiah, the desire of all Gentiles, which we translated into German with the word trost, or consolation. The word desire does not fully express this thought, since in German it reflects the inward delight and desire of the heart, active. But here the word designates the external thing, passive, which a heart longs for. It would surely not be wrong to translate it with the joy and delight of all Gentiles. In brief, it is the Messiah who would be the object of displeasure, disgust, and abomination for the unbelieving and hardened Jews, as Isaiah 53 prophesies. The Gentiles, on the other hand, would bid him welcome, as their heart's joy, delight, and every wish and desire. For he brings them deliverance from sin, death, devil, hell, and every evil eternally. This is indeed the Gentiles' desire, their heart's delight, joy, and comfort. This agrees with the saying of Jacob in Genesis 49, 10, and to Shiloh, or the Messiah, shall be the obedience of the peoples. That is to say, they will receive him gladly, hear his word, and become his people, without coercion, without the sword. It is as if he wished to say, the ignoble, uncircumcised Gentiles will do this, but my noble rascals, my circumcised, lost children, will not do it, but will rather rave and rant against it. Isaiah 2 and following, and Micah 4, verse 1 and following, also agree with this. It shall come to pass in the latter days that the mountain of the house of the Lord shall be established as the highest of the mountains, and shall be raised above the hills, and all the nations shall flow to it, doubtless voluntarily, motivated by desire and joy. And many people shall come and say, Come, let us go up to the mountain of the Lord, to the house of the God of Jacob, that he may teach us his ways, and that we may walk in his path. For out of Zion shall go forth the law, and the word of the Lord from Jerusalem. Thus the prophets speak throughout of the kingdom of the Messiah established among the Gentiles. Yes, this is it. This is the bone of contention. That is the source of the trouble. That makes the Jews so angry and foolish, and spurs them to arrive at such an accursed meaning, forcing them to pervert all of the statements in Scripture so shamefully. Namely, they do not want, they cannot endure, that we Gentiles should be their equal before God, and that the Messiah should be our comfort and joy as well as theirs. I say, before they would have us Gentiles, whom they incessantly mock, curse, damn, defame, and revile, share the Messiah with them, and be called their co-heirs and brethren, they would crucify ten more messiahs and kill God himself, if this were possible, together with all angels and all creatures, even at the risk of incurring thereby the penalty of a thousand hells instead of one. Such an incomprehensibly stubborn pride dwells in the noble blood of the fathers and circumcised saints. They alone want to have the messiah and be masters of the world. The accursed Goyim must be servants, give their desire, that is, their gold and silver, to the Jews, and let themselves be slaughtered like wretched cattle, 
They would rather remain lost consciously and eternally than to give up this view. From their youth, they have imbibed such venomous hatred against the goyim from their parents and their rabbis, and they still continuously drink it. As Psalm 109 declares, it has penetrated flesh and blood, marrow and bone, and has become part and parcel of their nature and their life. And as little as they can change flesh and blood, marrow and bone, so little can they change such pride and envy. They must remain thus and perish, unless God performs extraordinarily great miracles. If I wished to vex and anger a Jew severely, I would say, Listen, Jehudi, do you realize that I am a real brother of all the holy children of Israel and a co-heir in the kingdom of the true Messiah? Without doubt, I would meet with a nasty rebuff. If he could stare at me with the eyes of a basilisk, he would surely do it. And all the devils could not execute the evil he would wish me, even if God were to give them leave. Of that I am certain. However, I shall refrain from doing this, and I ask also that no one else do so, for Christ's sake. For the Jew's heart and mouth would overflow with a cloudburst of cursing and blaspheming of the name of Jesus Christ and of God the Father. We must conduct ourselves well and not give them cause for this, if we can avoid it, just as I must not provoke a madman, if I know that he will curse and blaspheme God. Quite apart from this, the Jews hear and see enough in us for which they ever blaspheme and curse the name of Jesus in their hearts, for they really are possessed. As we have already said, they cannot endure to hear or to see that we accursed Goyim should glory in the Messiah as our Chimdath, and that we are as good as they are, or as they think they are. Therefore, dear Christian, be advised and do not doubt that next to the devil you have no more bitter, venomous, and vehement foe than a real Jew who earnestly seeks to be a Jew. There may perhaps be some among them who believe what a cow or a goose believes, but their lineage and circumcision infect them all. Therefore the history books often accuse them of contaminating wells, of kidnapping and piercing children, as for example at Trent, Weissense, etc. They of course deny this. Whether it is true or not, I do know that they do not lack the complete, full, and ready will to do such things, either secretly or openly where possible. This you can assuredly expect from them, and you must govern yourself accordingly. If they do perform some good deed, you may rest assured that they are not prompted by love, nor is it done with your benefit in mind, since they are compelled to live among us. They do this for reasons of expediency, but their heart remains and is as I have described it. If you do not want to believe me, read Lyra, Bergenses, and other truthful and honest men. And even if they had not recorded it, you would find that Scripture tells of the two seeds, the serpents and the woman's. It says that these are enemies, and that God and the devil are at variance with each other. Their own writings and prayer books also state this plainly enough. A person who is unacquainted with the devil might wonder why they are so particularly hostile towards Christians. They have no reason to act this way, since we show them every kindness. They live among us, enjoy our shield and protection. They use our country and our highways, our markets and streets. Meanwhile, our princes and rulers sit there and snore with mouths hanging open and permit the Jews to take, steal, and rob from their open money bags and treasures, whatever they want. That is, they let the Jews by means of their usury skin and fleece them and their subjects and make them beggars with their own money. For the Jews who are exiles should really have nothing, and whatever they have must surely be our property. They do not work, they do not earn anything from us, nor do we give it or present it to them, yet they are in possession of our money and goods, and are our masters in our own countries and in their exile. A thief is condemned to hang for the theft of ten florins, and if he robs anyone on the highway, he forfeits his head. But when a Jew steals and robs ten tons of gold through his usury, he is more highly esteemed than God himself. In proof of this, we cite the bold boast with which they strengthen their faith and give vent to the venomous hatred 
of us, as they say among themselves, quote, Be patient and see how God is with us and does not desert his people, even in exile. We do not labor, and yet we enjoy prosperity and leisure. The accursed goyim have to work for us, but we get their money. This makes us their masters and them our servants. Be patient, dear children of Israel. Better times are in store for us. Our Messiah will come if we continue thus and acquire the chemdath of all the Gentiles by usury and other methods. End quote. Alas, this is what we endure for them. They are under our shield and protection, and yet, as I have said, they curse us. But we shall revert to this later. We are now speaking about the fact that they cannot tolerate having us as co-heirs in the kingdom of the Messiah, and that he is our chemdath, as the prophets abundantly attest. What does God say about this? He says that he will give the chemdath to the Gentiles, and that their obedience shall be pleasing to him as Jacob affirms in Genesis 49, together with all the prophets. He says that he will oppose the obduracy of the Jews most strenuously, rejecting them and choosing and accepting the Gentiles, even though the latter are not of the noble blood of the fathers or circumcised saints. For thus says Hosea too, And I will say to not my people, You are my people. And he shall say, Thou art my God. But to the Jew, he says, in Hosea 1, call his name, not my people, lo, ami, for you are not my people, and I am not your God. Moses, too, had sung this song long ago, Deuteronomy 32. They have stirred me to jealousy with what is no God. They have provoked me with their vain deeds. So I will stir them to jealousy with those who are no people. I will provoke them with a foolish nation. This verse has been in force now for nearly 1,500 years. We foolish Gentiles, who were not God's people, are now God's people. That drives the Jews to distraction and stupidity, and over this they become not God's people, who were once his people, and really should still be. But let us conclude our discussion of the saying of Haggai. We have convincing proof that the Messiah, the Gentiles, Chemdath, appeared at the time when the temple was standing. Thus, the ancients understood it, and the inane, flimsy glosses of the present-day Jews also testify to this, since they do not know how to deny it except by speaking of their own shame. For he who gives a hollow, meaningless, and irrelevant answer shows that he is defeated and condemns himself. It would have been better and less shameful if he had kept quiet, rather than giving a pointless answer that disgraces him. Thus Haggai too says, Once again, in a little while, I will shake the heavens, and the earth, and the sea, and the dry land, and I will shake all nations, and the desire of all the Gentiles shall come. This is how I, in the simplicity of my mind, understand these words. Since the beginning of the world, there has been enmity between the seed of the serpent and that of the woman, and there has always been conflict between them, sometimes more sometimes less. For wherever the seed of the woman is or appears, he causes strife and discord. This he says in the gospel, I have not come to bring peace on the earth, but a sword and disunity. Matthew 10.34. He takes the armor from the strong man, fully armed, who had peace in his palace. The latter cannot tolerate this, and strife is on. Angels contend against the devils in the air, and man against man on earth all on account of the woman's seed. To be sure, there is plenty of strife, war, and unrest in the world otherwise too. But since it is not undertaken on account of his seed, it is an insignificant thing in God's eyes. For in this conflict all the angels are involved. Since the advent of the seed, or of the Messiah, was close at hand, Haggai says, in a little while. This means that until now, the strife had been confined solely to my people Israel, that is, restricted to a small area. The devil was ever intent upon devouring them, and he set all the surrounding kings upon them. For he was well aware that the promised seed was in the people of Israel, the seed that was to despoil him. Therefore he was always eager to harass them. 
and he instigated one disturbance, dissatisfaction, war and strife after another. Well and good, now it will be but a little while, and I shall give him strife a plenty. I will initiate a struggle, and a good one at that, not only in a narrow nook and corner among the people of Israel, but as far as heaven and earth extend, on the sea and on the dry land, that is, where it is wet and where it is dry, whether on the mainland or on the islands, at the sea or on the waters, wherever human beings dwell. For as he says, I will shake all the Gentiles, so that the angels will contend with all the devils in heaven or in the air, and all men on earth will quarrel over the seed. For I shall send the Chimdath to all Gentiles. They will love him and adhere to him, as Genesis 49 says. The Gentiles will gather about him. And, on the other hand, they will grow hostile to the devil, the old serpent, and defect from him. Then all will take its due course when the God and Prince of this world grows wrathful, raves and rages, because he is obliged to yield his kingdom, his house, his equipment, his worship, his power, to the Chimdath and Shiloh, the woman's seed. Anyone can read the histories that date back to the time of Christ and learn how first the Jews and Gentiles, then the heretics, finally Muhammad, and at present the Pope, have raged and are still raging, quote, against the Lord and his Messiah, Psalm 2. And he will understand the words of Haggai that speak of shaking all the nations, etc. There is not a corner in the world nor a spot in the sea where the gospel has not resounded and brought the chimdath. As Psalm 18 declares, There is no speech, nor are there words. Their voice is not heard, yet their voice goes out through all the earth, and their words to the end of the world. The devil, too, appeared promptly on the scene, with murder by the hands of tyrants, with lies spoken by heretics, with all his devilish wiles and powers, which he still employs to impede and obstruct the course of the gospel. This is the strife in question. I shall begin the story of the struggle with that great villain Antiochus the Noble. Approximately 300 years elapsed between the time of Haggai and that of Antiochus. This is the short span of time in which peace prevailed, for the kings in Persia were very kind to them, nor did Alexander harm them, and they fared well also under his successors, up to the time of this filthy Antiochus, who ushered in the ut unrest and the misfortune. Through him the devil sought to exterminate the woman's seed. He pillaged the city of Jerusalem, the temple, the country, and its inhabitants. He desecrated the temple and raged as his god, the devil, impelled him. Practically all the good fortune of the Jews terminated right here. Down to the present they have never recovered their former position, and they never will. This will serve to supply a proper understanding of the Jews' glosses, which say that the chimdath of all the Gentiles, that is gold and silver, flowed into this temple. If the earlier kings had put anything into it, then this one took it all away again. This turns their glosses upside down to read, Antiochus distributes the chimdath of all Jews among the Gentiles. Thus, this verse of Haggai cannot be understood of the Gentiles' shirt or coat. For following these three hundred years of this, quote, little while, and from then on, they did not get much from the Gentiles, but rather were compelled to give them much. Soon after this, the Romans came and made a clean sweep of it and placed Herod over them as king. What Herod gave them, they soon learned. Therefore, from the time of Antiochus on, they enjoyed but a small measure of peace, Daniel's report also stops with Antiochus, as if to say, Now the end is at hand, and all is over. Now the Messiah is standing at the door, who will stir up ever more contention. Now the detestable Antiochus not only despoiled and desecrated the temple, but also suppressed the Shebet, or Sultan, the prince in the house of David, namely, the last prince, John Hyrcanus. None of his descendants again ascended the throne of David or became ruler. Only the Safra, or Mehokek, remained until Herod. From that point on, David's house looked as if its light had been extinguished, as if there were no shultan or scepter in Judah. It had in fact come to an end, although there were about 150 years left until the coming of the Messiah. Such an occurrence is not unusual. Anything that is going to break will first crack 
or burst apart a little. Whatever is going to sink will first submerge or sway a little. The scepter of Judah went through the same process toward the end. It became weak, it groaned, it moaned for 150 years until it fell apart entirely at the hands of the Romans and of Herod. During these 150 years, the princes of Judah did not rule, but lived as common citizens, perhaps quite impoverished. For Mary, Christ's mother in Nazareth, states that she is a handmaid of poor and low estate. It is also true, however, that the Maccabees fought victoriously against Antiochus. Daniel 11 refers to this as, quote, a little help. Those who in this way ascended the throne of David and assumed the rule were priests from the tribe of Levi and Aaron. Now one could say with good reason that the royal and the priestly tribes were mixed. For in Second Chronicles 22, we read that Jehoshabeath, the daughter of King Jehoram, and the sister of King Ahaziah, was the wife of Jehoiada, the high priest. Thus, coming from the royal house of Solomon, she was grafted into the priestly tribe and became one trunk and tree with it. Therefore, she was the ancestress of all the descendants of Jehoiada the priest, a true Sarah of the priestly family. Therefore, the Maccabees may indeed be called David's blood and children, as viewed from the maternal lineage. For descent from a mother is just as valid as that from a father. That is also recognized in other countries. For instance, our emperor King Charles is king in Spain by virtue of his descent from his mother and not from his father. And his father Philip was Duke of Burgundy, not because of his father, Maximilian, but because of his mother, Mary. Thus David calls all the children of Jehoiada and of Jehoshabeath his natural children, his sons and daughters, because Jehoshabeath was descended from his son Solomon. So through the Maccabees, Solomon's family regained rule and scepter through the maternal side, after it had been lost through Ahaziah on the paternal side. It remained in David's family until Herod, who did away with it and abolished both Shulten and Safra, or the Sanhedrin. Now, finally, there lies the scepter of Judah and the Mehokek. There the house of David is darkened on both the paternal and the maternal sides. Therefore the Messiah must now be at hand, the true light of David, the true son, who had sustained his house until that time, and who would sustain it and enlighten it from that point on to all eternity. This conforms to God's promise that the scepter of Judah will remain until Messiah appears, and that the house of David will be preserved forever and will never die out. But as we said, despite all of this, God must be the Jew's liar, who has not yet sent the Messiah, as he promised and vowed. Furthermore, God says through Haggai, I will fill this house with splendor. The silver is mine, and the gold is mine. The splendor of this latter house shall be greater than the former, etc. It is true that this temple displayed great splendor during the 300 years prior to Antiochus, since the Persians and the successors of Alexander, the kings in Syria, and King Philadelphus in Egypt contributed much towards it. But, despite all of this, it did not compare in magnificence with the first temple, the Temple of Solomon. The text must refer to a different splendor here, or else Solomon's temple will far surpass it. For in the first temple there was also an abundance of gold and silver, and in addition the Ark of the Covenant, the Mercy Seat, the Cherubim, Moses' tablets, Aaron's rod, the bread of heaven and the golden vessel, Aaron's robes, also the Urim, and Thummim, and the sacred oil with which the kings and priests were anointed. Burgensis on Daniel 9. When Solomon dedicated this temple, fire fell from heaven and consumed the sacrifice, and the temple was filled with what he called a cloud of divine majesty. God himself was present in this cloud, as Solomon himself says. The Lord has said that he would dwell in thick darkness. He had done the same thing in the wilderness as he hovered over Moses' tabernacle. There was none of this splendor, surpassing gold and silver, in the temple of Haggai. Yet God says that it will show forth greater splendor than the first one. Let the Jews pipe up 
and say what constituted this great splendor. They cannot pass over this in silence, for the text and the confession of the ancient Jews, their forefathers, both state that the Chemdath of the Gentiles, the Messiah, came at the time when the same temple stood and glorified Jesus Christ. The true Chemdath was presented in the temple by his mother, and that he himself often taught and did miracles there. This is the true cloud, his tender humanity, in which God manifested his presence and let himself be seen and heard. The blind Jews may deride this, but our faith is strengthened by it, until they can adduce a splendor of the temple excelling this chemdath of all the Gentiles. That they will do when they erect a third temple, that is to say, when God is a liar, when the devil is the truth, and when they themselves again take possession of Jerusalem. Not before. Josephus writes that Herod raised the temple of Haggai because it was not sufficiently splendid, and rebuilt it so that it was equal or superior to the temple of Solomon in splendor. I would be glad to believe the history books, however, even if this temple had been constructed of diamonds and rubies, it still would have lacked the items mentioned from that sublime old holy place, namely the ark, the mercy seat, the cherubim, etc. Furthermore, since Herod had not been commissioned by God to build it, but did so as an impious enemy of God and of his people, motivated by vanity and pride in his own honor, his whole structure and work was not as good as the most puny little stone that Zerubbabel placed into the temple by command of God. Herod certainly did not merit such grace for tearing down and desecrating the temple which had been commanded, built, and consecrated by the word of God, and then presuming to erect a much more glorious one without God's word and command. God permitted this out of consideration for the place which he had selected for the temple and so that the destruction of the temple might have the negative significance that the people of Israel should henceforth be without temple, word of God, and all, that it instead would be given wholly to the splendor of the world under the guise of the service to God. This temple was not only less splendid than Solomon's, but it was also violated in many ways more terribly than Solomon's temple, and was often completely desecrated. This happened first, against the will of the Jews, when Antiochus robbed it of all its contents, placed an idol on the altar, sacrificed pork, and made a regular pigsty, and an idolatrous desolation of the temple, instituting a horrible slaughter in Jerusalem, as though he were the devil himself, as we read in 1 Maccabees 1, and as Daniel 11 had predicted. No lesser outrage was committed by the Romans, and especially by that filthy emperor Caligula, who also placed his mark of abomination in the temple. Daniel 9 and 12 speak of this. Such ignominy and disgrace were not experienced by Solomon's temple at the hands of the Gentiles and foreigners. This makes it difficult to see how Haggai's words were fulfilled. I will fill this temple with glory which will exceed the glory of that temple. One might rather say that it was filled with dishonor exceeding the dishonor of that temple. That is, if one thinks of external and outward honor. Consequently, if Haggai's words are to be counted true, he must be referring to a different kind of splendor. Secondly, the Jews themselves also desecrated this temple more viciously than the other one ever was desecrated, namely with spiritual idolatries. Lyra writes, and others too, in many passages, that the Jews, after their return from the Babylonian captivity, did not commit idolatry or sin by killing prophets as gravely as before. Thereby, he wants to prove that their present exile must be due to a more heinous sin than idolatry, the murder of the prophets, etc., namely, the crucifixion of the Messiah. This argument is good, valid, and cogent. That they no longer killed the prophets is not to be attributed to a lack of evil intentions, but to the fact that they no longer had any prophets who reproved their idolatry, greed, and other vices. That is why they could no longer kill prophets. To be sure, the last prophet, Malachi, who began to rebuke the priests, barely escaped, if indeed he did escape. But they did practice idolatry more outrageously at the time of this temple than at the time of the other. Not the coarse, palpable, stupid variety, but the subtle, spiritual kind. Zechariah portrays this under the image of a flying scroll and of an ephah going forth, 
Zechariah 5. And Zechariah 11 and 12 foretell this infamy of their selling God for 30 pieces of silver and their piercing him through. More on that elsewhere. Is it not shame enough that the priests at the same time perverted God's Ten Commandments so flagrantly? Tell me, what idolatry compares with the abomination of changing the word of God into lies? To do that is truly to set up idols, i.e., false gods, under the cloak of God's name. And that is forbidden in the second commandment, which reads, You shall not take the name of the Lord your God in vain. Why? Their Talmud and their rabbis record that it is no sin for a Jew to kill a Gentile, but it is only a sin for him to kill a brother Israelite, nor is it a sin for a Jew to break his oath to a Gentile. Likewise, they say, that it is rendering God a service to steal or rob from a goy, as they in fact do through their usury. For since they believe that they are the noble blood and the circumcised saints, and we the accursed goyim, they cannot treat us too harshly or commit sin against us, for they are the lords of the world, and we are their servants, yea, their cattle. In brief, our evangelists also tell us what their rabbis taught. In Matthew 15, we read that they abrogated the fourth commandment, which enjoins honor of father and mother. And in Matthew 23, that they were given to much shameful doctrine, not to mention what Christ says, in Matthew 5, about how they preached and interpreted the Ten Commandments so deviously, how they installed money changers, traitors, and all sorts of usurers in the temple, prompting our Lord to say that they had made the house of God into a den of robbers. Now figure out for yourself what a great honor that is, and how the temple is filled with such glory that God must call his own house a den of robbers, because so many souls had been murdered through their greedy false doctrine, that is, through double idolatry. The Jews still persist in such doctrine to the present day. They imitate their fathers and pervert God's word. They are steeped in greed, in usury. They steal and murder when they can and where they can, and ever teach their children to do likewise. Even this is not the greatest shame of this temple. The real abomination of all abominations, the shame of all shames, is this, that at the time of this temple there were several chief priests in an entire sect which were Sadducean, that is Epicurean, who did not believe in the existence of any angel, devil, heaven, hell, or life after this life. And such fellows were expected to enter the temple, vested with the priestly office and in priestly garments, and sacrifice pray, and offer burnt offerings for the people, preach to them, and rule them. Tell me, how much worse could Antiochus have been with his idol and sacrifice of pork than were these Sadducean pigs and sows? In view of this, what remains of Haggai's statement that this temple's glory was greater than that of Solomon's temple? Before God and reason, a real pigsty might be called a royal hall when compared with this temple, because of such great, horrible, and monstrous sows. How much more honorably do the pagan philosophers, as well as the poets, write and teach not only about God's rule and about the life to come, but also about temporal virtues. They teach that man, by nature, is obliged to serve his fellow man, to keep faith also with his enemies, and to be loyal and helpful, especially in the time of need. Thus Cicero and his kind teach. Indeed, I believe that three of Aesop's fables, half of Cato, and several comedies of Terence, contain more wisdom and more instruction about good works than can be found in the books of all the Talmudists and rabbis, and more than may ever occur to the hearts of all the Jews. Bergensis, who was one of their very learned rabbis, and who through the grace of God became a Christian, a very rare happening, is much agitated by the fact that they curse us Christians so vilely in their synagogues, as Lyra also writes, and he deduces from this that they cannot be God's people. For if they were, they would emulate the example of the Jews in the Babylonian captivity. To them, Jeremiah wrote, Seek the welfare of the city where I have sent you into exile, and pray to the Lord on its behalf, for in its welfare you will find your welfare. Jeremiah 29. But our bastards and pseudo-Jews think they must curse us, hate us, and inflict every possible harm upon us, although they have no cause for it. Therefore, they surely are no longer God's people. But we shall say more about this later.
To return to the subject of Haggai's temple, it is certain that no house was ever disgraced more than this holy house of God was by such vile sows as the Sadducees and the Pharisees. Yet Christ calls it God's house, because the four pillars are his. Therefore, to offset this disgrace, a greater and different splendor must have inherited in it than that of silver and gold. If not, Haggai will fare ill with his prophecy that the splendor of this temple will surpass that of Solomon's temple. Amid such colossal shame, no splendor can be found here other than that of the Chemdath, who will appear in a short time and surpass such shame with his splendor. The Jews can produce no other splendor. Their mouth is stopped. I must break off here and leave the last part of Haggai to others, the section in which he prophesies that the Lord, as he says, quote, will give peace in this place. Can it be possible that this applies to the time from Antiochus up to the present, during which the Jews have experienced every misfortune and are still in exile? For there shall be peace in this place, says the Lord. The place is still there. The temple and the place have vanished. No doubt the Jews will be able to interpret this. The history books inform me that there was but little peace prior to Antiochus for about 300 years, and subsequent to that time, none at all down to the present hour, except for the peace that reigned at the time of the Maccabees. As I have already said, I shall leave this to others. Finally, we must lend ear to the great prophet Daniel. A special angel with the proper name, Gabriel, talks with him. The like of this is not found elsewhere in the Old Testament. The fact that the angel is mentioned by name marks it as something extraordinary. This is what he tells Daniel. Seventy weeks of years are decreed concerning your people and your holy city to finish the transgression, to put an end to sin, and to atone for iniquity, to bring in everlasting righteousness, to seal both vision and profit, and to anoint a most holy place. We cannot now discuss this rich text, which is actually one of the foremost in all of Scripture. And, as is only natural, everybody has reflected on it, for it not only fixes the time of Christ's advent, but also foretells what he will do, namely, take away sin, bring righteousness, and do this by means of his death. It establishes Christ as the priest who bears the sin of the whole world. This, I say, we must now set aside and deal only with the question of the time, as we are determined to do, whether such a Messiah or priest has already come or is still to come. This we do for the strengthening of our faith against all devils and men. In the first place, there is complete agreement on this, that the seventy weeks are not weeks of days, but weeks of years, that one week comprises seven years, which produces a sum total of 490 years. That is the first point. Second, it is also agreed that these 70 weeks had ended when Jerusalem was destroyed by the Romans. There is no difference of opinion on these two points, although many are in the dark when it comes to the matter of knowing the precise time of which these 70 weeks began and when they terminated. It is not necessary for us to settle this question here, since it is generally assumed that they were fulfilled about the time of the destruction of Jerusalem. This will suffice us for the present. If this is true, as it must be true since after the destruction of Jerusalem none of the seventy weeks was left, then the Messiah must have come before the destruction of Jerusalem, while something of those seventy weeks still remained, namely the last week as the text later clearly and convincingly attests. After the seven weeks and 62 weeks, that is, after 69 weeks, namely, in the last or 70th week, Christ will be killed, in such a way, however, that he will become alive again. For the angel says that he shall make a strong covenant with many in the last week. This he cannot do while dead, he must be alive. To make a covenant can have no other meaning than to fulfill God's promise to the fathers, namely, to disseminate the blessing promised in Abraham's seed to all the Gentiles. As the angel states earlier, the visions and prophecies shall be sealed or fulfilled. This requires a live Messiah, who, however, has previously been killed. 
but the Jews will have none of this. Therefore, we shall let it rest at that and hold to our opinion that the Messiah must have appeared during those seventy weeks. This the Jews cannot refute. For in their books, as well as in certain histories, we learn that not just a few Jews, but all of Jewry at that time assumed that the Messiah must have come or must be present at that very moment. This is what we want to hear. When Herod was forcibly made king of Judah and Israel by the Romans, the Jews surely realized that the scepter would thus depart from them. They resisted this move vigorously, and in the thirty years of their resistance many thousand Jews were slain and much blood was shed, until they finally surrendered in exhaustion. In the meantime, the Jews looked about for the Messiah. Thus, a hue and cry arose that the Messiah had been born, as, in truth, he had been. For our Lord Christ was born in the thirtieth year of Herod's reign. But Herod forcibly suppressed this report, slaying all the young children in the region of Bethlehem, so that our Lord had to be taken for refuge to Egypt. Herod even killed his own son because he was born of a Jewish mother. He was worried that through this son the scepter might revert to the Jews, and that he might gain the Jews' loyalty, since, as Philo records, the rumor of the birth of Christ had been spread abroad. As our evangelists relate, more than thirty years later, John the Baptist comes out of the wilderness and proclaims that the Lord had not only been born, but also was already among them, and would reign shortly after him. Suddenly, thereafter, Christ himself appears, preaches, and performs great miracles, so that the Jews hoped that now, after the loss of the scepter, Shiloh had come. But the chief priests, the rulers, and their followers took offense at the person, since he did not appear as a mighty king, but wandered about like a poor beggar. They had made up their mind that the Messiah would unite the Jews and not only wrest the scepter from the foreign king, but also subdue the Romans and all the world under himself with the sword, installing them as mighty princes over all the Gentiles. When they were disappointed in these expectations, the noble blood and circumcised saints were vexed, as people who had the promise of the kingdom and could not attain it through this beggar. Therefore they despised him and did not accept him. But when they disdained John and his, Christ's, message and miracles, reviling them as the deeds of Beelzebub, he spoiled and ruined matters entirely. He rebuked and chided them severely, something he should not, of course, have done, for being greedy, evil, and disobedient children false teachers, seducers of the people, etc. In brief, a brood of serpents and children of the devil. On the other hand, he was friendly to sinners and tax collectors, to Gentiles and to Romans, giving the impression that he was the foe of the people of Israel and the friend of Gentiles and villains. Now the fat was really in the fire. They grew wrathful, bitter, and hateful, and ranted against him. Finally, they contrived the plot to kill him. And that is what they did. They crucified him, as ignominiously as possible. They gave free rein to their anger, so that even the Gentile Pilate noticed this and testified that they were condemning and killing him out of hatred and envy, innocently and without cause. When they had executed this false messiah, that is the conception they wanted to convey of him, they did not abandon the delusion that the messiah had to be at hand or nearby. They constantly murmured against the Romans because of the scepter. Soon, too, the rumor circulated that Jesus, whom they had killed, had again arisen, and that he was now really being proclaimed openly and freely as the Messiah. The people in the city of Jerusalem were adhering to him, as well as the Gentiles in Antioch and everywhere in the country. Now they really had their hands full. They had to oppose this dead Messiah and his followers, lest he be accepted and resurrected and as the Messiah. They also had to oppose the Romans, lest their hope for a Messiah be forever bereft of the scepter. At one place a slaughter of the Christians was initiated, at another an uprising against the Romans. To these tactics they devoted themselves for approximately forty years, until the Romans finally were constrained to lay waste country and city. This delusion regarding their false Christ and their persecution of the true Christ cost them Eleven times one hundred thousand men, as Josephus reports, together with the most horrible devastation of country and city, as well as the forfeiture of scepter, temple, priesthood, 
and all that they possessed. This deep and cruel humiliation, which is terrible to read and to hear about, surely should have made them pliable and humble. Alas, they became seven times more stubborn, viler, and prouder than before. This was due, in part, to the fact that they, in their dispersion, had to witness how the Christians daily grew and increased with their Messiah. The saying of Moses, found in Deuteronomy 32, was now completely fulfilled in them. They have stirred me to jealousy with what is no God, so I will stir them to jealousy with those who are no people. Likewise, as Hosea says, I will say to not my people, you are my people. But you are not my people, and I am not your God. Hosea 2. They stubbornly insisted on having their own Messiah, in whom the Gentiles should not claim a share, and they persisted in trying to exterminate this Messiah, in whom both Jews and Gentiles gloried. Everywhere throughout the Roman Empire, they intervened, and wherever they could ferret out a Christian, in any corner, they dragged him out before the judges and accused him. They themselves could not pass sentence on him, since they had neither legal authority nor scepter, until they had him killed. Thus they shed very much Christian blood and made such innumerable martyrs, also outside the Roman Empire and in Persia, and wherever they could. Still, they clung to the delusion that the Messiah must have appeared, since the seventy weeks of Daniel had expired and the temple of Haggai had been destroyed. However, they disliked the person of Jesus of Nazareth, and therefore they went ahead and elevated one of their own number to be the Messiah. This came about as follows. They had a rabbi, or Talmudist, named Akiba, a very learned man, esteemed by them more highly than all other rabbis, a venerable, honorable, gray-haired man. He taught the verses of Haggai and of Daniel, also of Jacob, in Genesis 49, with ardor, saying that there had to be a Messiah among the people of God, since the time fixed by Scripture was at hand. Then he chose one, surnamed Kokba, which means a star. According to Burgensis, his right name was Hutoliba. He is well known in all the history books, where he is called Bin Kozibo, or Bar Koziban. This man had to be their Messiah and he gladly complied. All the people in the rabbis rallied about him and armed themselves thoroughly with the intention of doing away with both Christians and Romans. Now they had the Messiah fashioned to their liking and their mind, who was proclaimed by the aforementioned passages of Scripture. This unrest began approximately 30 years after the destruction of Jerusalem, under the reign of Emperor Trajan. Rabbi Akiba, was Kokba's prophet and spirit who inflamed and incited him and vehemently urged him on, applying all the verses of Scripture that deal with the Messiah to him before the people and proclaiming, You are the Messiah! He applied to him especially the saying of Balaam, recorded in Numbers 24, by reason of his surname, Kokba, a star. For in that passage, Balaam says in a vision, A star shall come forth out of Jacob, and a scepter shall rise out of Israel. It shall crush the forehead of Moab, and break down all the sons of Sheth. Edom shall be dispossessed. Seir, also his enemies, shall be dispossessed, while Israel does valiantly. By Jacob shall dominion be exercised, and the survivors of cities be destroyed. That was a proper sermon for thoroughly misleading such a foolish, angry, restive mob, which is exactly what happened. To ensure the success of this venture, and guard against its going awry, that exalted and precious Rabbi Akiba, the old fool and simpleton, made himself Kokba's guardsman, or armor-bearer, his armige, as the history books have it. If I am not translating the term correctly, let someone else improve on it. The person is meant who is positioned beside the king or prince and whose chief duty is to defend him on the battlefield or in combat, either on horse or on foot. To be sure, something more is implied here, since he is also a prophet, a munzer, to use contemporary terms. So this is where the scepter of Judah and the Messiah now resided. They are sure of it. They carried on like this for some 30 years. Kokba always had himself addressed as King Messiah, and butchered throngs of Christians who refused to deny our Messiah, Jesus Christ. His captains also harassed the Romans where they could. 
especially in Egypt, they at one time defeated the Roman captain during the reign of Trajan. Now their heart, brain, and belly began to swell with conceit. God, they inferred, had to be for them and with them. They occupied a town near Jerusalem called Betir. In the Bible, it is known as Beth Horon. At this point, they were convinced that their Messiah, King Kokba, was Lord of the world and had vanquished the Christians and the Romans and had carried the day. But Emperor Hadrian sent his army against them, laid siege to Betir, conquered it, slew their Messiah and his prophet, star and darkness, lord and armor-bearer. Their own books lament that there were twice 80,000 men at Batir who blew the trumpets, who were captains over vast hosts of men, and that 40 times 100,000 men were slain, not including those slain at Alexandria. The latter are said to have numbered 12 times 100,000. However, it seems to me that they are exaggerating enormously. I interpret this to mean that the two times 80,000 trumpeters represent that many valiant and able-bodied men equipped for battle, each of whom would have been able to lead large bodies of soldiers in battle. Otherwise, this sounds too devilishly mendacious. After this formidable defeat, they themselves called Kokba their lost messiah, Kozba, which rhymes with it and has a similar ring. For thus write their Talmudists, you must not read Kokba, but Kozba. Therefore all the history books now refer to him as Koziban, Kozba meaning false. His attempt had miscarried, and he had proved a false and not a true Messiah. Just as we Germans might say by way of rhyme, you are not a Deutscher, but a Teicher, not German, but a deceiver, not a Welsher, but a Falscher not a foreigner of romance origin, but a falsifier. Of a usurer, I may say, you are not a berger, but a verger, not a citizen, but a slayer. Such rhyming is customary in all languages. Our Eusebius reports this story in his Ecclesiastical History, Book 4, Chapter 6. Here he uses the name bar Kokobas, saying that this was an extremely cruel battle in which the Jews were driven, quote-unquote, far from their country, that their impious eyes were no longer able to see their fatherland, even if they ascended the highest mountains. Such horrible stories are sufficient witness that all of Jewry understood that this had to be the time of the Messiah, since the seventy weeks had elapsed. Haggai's temple had been destroyed, and the scepter had been wrested from Judah, as the statements of Jacob in Genesis 49, of Haggai 2, and of Daniel 9 clearly indicated and announced. God be praised that we Christians are certain and confident of our belief that the true Messiah, Jesus Christ, did come at that time. To prove this, we have not only his miraculous deeds, which the Jews themselves cannot deny, but also the gruesome downfall and misfortune because of the name of the Messiah, of his enemies who wanted to exterminate him together with all his adherents. How could they otherwise have brought such misery upon their heads if they had not been convinced that the time of the Messiah was at hand? And I think this does surely constitute coming to grief and running their heads, now for a second time, against, quote-unquote, the stone of offense and the rock of stumbling, to quote Isaiah 8. So many hundreds of thousands attempted to devour Jesus of Nazareth, but over this they themselves, quote, stumbled and fell, and were broken, snared, and taken, as Isaiah says. Since two such terrible and awesome attempts had most miserably failed, the first at Jerusalem under Vespasian, the other at Betir under Hadrian, they surely should have come to their senses, have become pliable and humble, and concluded, God help us! How does this happen? The time of the Messiah's advent has, in accord with the prophets, words, and promises, come and gone, and we are beaten so terribly and cruelly over it. What if our ideas regarding the Messiah, that he should be a secular kokba, have deceived us, and he came in a different manner and form? Is it possible that the Messiah is Jesus of Nazareth, to whom so many Jews and Gentiles adhere, who daily perform so many wondrous signs? Alas, they became seven times more stubborn and baser than before. Their conception of a worldly Messiah must be right and cannot fail. There must be a mistake about the designated time. 
The prophets must be lying and fail rather than they. They will have nothing of this Jesus, even if they must pervert all of Scripture, have no God, and never get a Messiah. That's the way they want it.